Good afternoon and welcome to today's Maniac Talk. It's such a great honor for me to welcome our speaker, Dr. Edward Rogers, Chief Knowledge Officer at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Ed's story, Anything Can Be a Game, is about a journey shaped by lessons learned growing up in Saudi Arabia, going to school in southern India, and living in Lebanon and England with his wife and kids while doing relief work. Places where he learned the value of diversity in this world. When he came to Godard in May 2003, almost 16 years ago, his mission and mandate was not very clear, but his spirit of adventure and risk-taking allowed him to introduce very successfully knowledge management for the first time at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, where teams learn from player lessons, there's grassroots sharing, thanks to Ed, and learning, and the center creates value from knowledge embedded in missions and are held by employees. According to Ed, you have a different view of life when you have lived in other countries. You don't have to be a millionaire to travel around the world. It doesn't really matter where you go. Any new place will expand your knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our speaker, Edward Rogers. That's an introduction to live up to. Am I supposed to sing and dance now or give a yeah. talk? <laughs> give a talk. Some people might rather see me sing and dance. The talk might be boring. Anyway, my name is Ed Rogers, and thank you very much for coming this afternoon. I appreciate it. I consider it a privilege, and it's a privilege to speak to you today about the rest of the story to do with Ed Rogers and who is this guy who showed up in 2003, and as he was quite correct, uh, my first meeting with the center director when I was, after I was hired, went, but went, went like this. Center director, so what are you actually going to do? Which is kind of like, we're not really sure why we hired you, but it sounded like a good idea at the time. And you said some funny words that made sense to us, and so, yeah, 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 we need one of those. Hire him. And they really didn't know what to do with me. Of course, I had no idea what I was going to do either, uh, which made it interesting and attractive. Uh, so this is a story of my life, uh, and I'm going to highlight some events and some people that shaped my life and who I am and kind of explain why you got what you got when you got Ed Rogers coming to Goddard and spending 16 years here being the chief knowledge officer. So hopefully it'll make sense and uh, you can enjoy it, the story with me. Uh, First comment goes to my real team, and I just wanted, this was the title page for my dissertation and the acknowledgement page, where I dutifully put my motto in life, anything can be a game, and that's the date of our wedding. That's not the date of my PhD. <laughs> it was uh, 20 years later. And my family. So the only person representing my family today is my brother, Glenn, who's sitting right here. Looks just like me, it's easy to pick him out. <laughs> And you'll hear more about him in a little bit. Um, I also want to give credit for inspiration to this theme to Mary Poppins because it definitely inspired me to the idea as a, that you can make cleaning up the nursery a game, well then anything can be a game. We all know that story from Mary Poppins. But for my life it sort of started, I go back to my grandparents. This is a picture of Bird and Ruth Stevenson who around 1919, 1920, so just about a hundred years ago, sailed on this boat to China under a Rockefeller Foundation grant to install and operate the first x-ray machine in China. So talk about technology export, this was going. So they, they were there for, my mother was born there in 1923, and they completed their, their five-year stint of doing this, this task and came back. But uh, my mother, like her mother, uh, had a very adventurous spirit and was always interested in going places. Uh, and uh, so my mother, all her life, wanted to travel and go and do places. So that's, we'll come back to how that inter, inter, interacted with my life. But uh, then in 1957, a couple of interesting things happened. 
uh, my mother became pregnant. Sputnik launched, and uh, by the end of the year, uh, my father was studying physics at University of Pittsburgh, received his PhD in, Pits in, in physics. So all these things happened in 1958. And uh, so it's sort of interesting that my life began the same time NASA did, after all these activities. And if you were a physicist in the 50s, Sputnik in the space was a big deal. Everybody wanted to be a physicist. It was a very cool field to be in. And uh, so here's some, my dad was a very avid uh, movie taker, was a big hobby of his, and he left us boxes and boxes of home movies, which I've sorted through and found a few excerpts for you. So apparently I was a very happy little baby. I was a fat baby. And uh, my mother attributed that to her rebelling against the wisdom of the day. My brothers were all bottle fed. She said, this is nuts. God gave me milk. My baby should drink it. So against all the advice of the conventionalism of the day, she, and I turned out to be quite healthy and quite chubby. <laughs> so she always attributed it to that. And she said, sometimes you just got to listen to what you know. Her instincts, and we used to have movie night at the house. This was the favorite movie of my older brothers, which they liked. It. Dad, show us the one about Ed's butt. <laughs> Nobody else ever got a butt photo, and no, there's not a full Monty coming. <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry. But uh, there were a lot of happy pictures of my mother, and uh, my mother and I were very close. I was her baby, and uh, we, were, we were always quite close. And uh, I think, well, to be honest, she wanted a girl. But what can I say? <laughs> Couldn't help her there, but I was her helper. I was youngest, so I was always her helper around the house. I was always her helper in the kitchen. Everyone else <laughs> left. I was the last one at home, you know, her baby that finally left the nest, all that kind of stuff. So these are very meaningful pictures to me, to see my mother very happy with me before I even really was aware of it. So I understand where that relationship came from. Okay, so this is the family, and there's Eddie in the bottom. You can see my mother already looks a little tired. Um, but she was a woman of, of, of great faith, very devout uh, Methodist, and uh, believed in a number of things which were very uh, high value to her. Uh, one was uh, she did not believe in drinking alcohol, which made it interesting being raising all these boys. Uh, and she also believed in a lot of things about equality of people. And uh, so my father worked in Washington in the summer of 63, and she insisted on taking her family to Washington, D.C. that summer to hear a man talk about peace. Now, this was also against much advice. People advised them there will be violence, you might get hurt, you're taking children, this, who knows what might happen. She said, nonsense, this man is going to speak about peace. It's a world-changing event. We're going to go hear him. And my dad took movies. So here's our family on the Washington Mall in 1963, and you can see the march, and he took us right up to the front to make sure we could hear what this man had to say. Now, a lot of this didn't have a big impact on me until later on. I was only, you know, five. But I do remember the event, and I remember being questioning, why are we here? There's a man over there telling us some important things. I remember my dad kept saying. So this. Uh, Mother's inspiration was a great impact on my life from a very early age, and you can, you'll see other things that this came about. Another one that was a big impact, my parents believed firmly in music. Uh, music lessons were not an option, although I was not very dutiful. Looking back, it's one of those things, don't you wish you'd paid attention to what your parents were saying and making you do? Because I had to learn how to sing and play music when I was 50, and it's a lot, would have been a lot easier when I was five. Uh, but my mother's adventurous spirit pressured my family and my father to look for a job somewhere overseas. We were living in Pennsylvania in a small college at the time. And lo and behold, he found a job in Saudi Arabia <laughs> where they were building a new university. And they had to hire a whole faculty to come and teach in this new university. And so we went there. We'd stop at the sand and ride camels in the sand dunes and do all sorts of things. Um, we'd also sit with Bedouin in the in the in the desert and, and sit and chat with them and visit their life. It was just a very interesting, my parents were not afraid to cross cultural divides and wander into other space and just see how people lived and listen, find out what they were doing. It was very interesting times. This is the college that was built. This was a pile of rocks, a hill of rocks, and they built this entire college campus while we lived there on top of it. 
But we did a lot of traveling in the desert as well. Uh, here we are dressed up as, uh, as Bedouins. And one of the interesting things was the students, which I didn't appreciate again until much later, what kind of a change they were making. I'll give you one simple story. They, used, they were very hospitable, and they would invite their professor, of course, come to their house, which would have been a great honor, you know, to have their teacher come visit their family. And this one student invited my parents to come visit his family. So my father said, okay, when would you like us to come? Meaning like, you know, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, you know, that kind of thing. He said, how about November? That's kind of an odd invitation. It's like, what do you mean November? Well, they're Bedouin. In November, they'll be nearby, according to their migratory schedule. So in November, it'll only be about an hour drive. We can go see them. Is that okay? I mean, it's just mind-boggling to think about, you know, the difference of culture. And these were his students. He was teaching physics, who later became the people who operated Aramco, the first crop of Saudis when they nationalized the company. That was the whole goal of the university, was to train Saudis and skill them enough to be able to operate Aramco, which they did uh, later on. Uh, we did many adventures. Uh, we would go by caravans traveling across the desert, uh, learned a lot about safety and precautions, because if you didn't plan ahead and take precautions, you would get stuck out there and die, and nobody's coming to look for you. So we would take uh, groups of uh, Land Rovers, usually with some old timers who knew their way around, and we would travel and camp and circle them up at night. And uh, so this way I learned both adventures and I learned about being cautious about what you do. There are risks involved. We went down south. This is in the southern part of Saudi Arabia near Yemen where the mountains are. You've probably heard about it in the news with things going on. So there's lots of areas uh, of, of Saudi Arabia that are very interesting in different climates and environments. So you, we got caught in a flash flood. There's an exercise and lesson. What looks like a dry creek bed suddenly became four feet deep in water. You know, you learn things when you see these with your own eyes and you learn to be cautious about them. Uh, this was my elementary school, <laughs> uh, one, uh, one building, uh, established there in 1961. Uh, Madrasa Dahran al almi So this is the school they built for the American expats at the consulate ground. But things weren't as abnormal as you might think growing up in Saudi Arabia because Aramco had a little America camp they made for their employees. And one of the things they did was they had uh, uh, sports teams and stuff. Here I am right over here on the end. And I learned about sports and played sports and I was happy to play. It was the only sport I was actually any good at at all. And of course it ended after I was 12. So I never really became much of a sport performer person. But I also learned another lesson in, in playing this game. I ended up being the leadoff hitter for this team because I hit a 475. And I'd always get on base. But I never hit a home run, I never cleared the bases, that kind of thing. So it was kind of a lesson to me that there's a big value in being a good player on a team. Not everybody has to be, you know, Vetchkin or whatever, you know, the star. Everyone contributes to a team, and I contributed my part. So it was an interesting lesson. NASA steps back into the picture in the late 60s. In our classroom in 68 and 69, we built this Apollo mock-up here, and uh, my friends and I borrowed jump, uh, flight suits from the Air Force. Uh, uh, the guy on the left there, his father worked at the Air Force uh, station, and we borrowed some flight suits and uh, reenacted the Apollo missions in our classroom, as I'm sure many of us probably did who were alive at the time, and uh, certainly another. So there's these touch points of NASA that came in and out of my life over the years. That was one of them. Uh, this is my fifth grade class, and I was already learning to stand out as I was standing out right there, violating safety rules in front of the balcony. Um, Jump to my eighth grade class, and the reason I'm showing this picture is not only was it just 15 people, uh, but my class included Americans, Indian, Italian, Swiss, Egyptian, Palestinian, and Texans, all different countries. <laughs> if you've been in the oil business, you know that Texans are uh, their, own, their own country. So it was a very interesting, diverse class, and we learned a lot of things about that. So the next sort of milestone I put is after that a graduate, I went to a leadership training program at Philmont Scout Ranch. We were part of a scout program, which Aramco also had. I think I'm standing right there. And this was a very interesting eye-opening experience for me because it was a leadership training program to train you to be a junior scout leader and go back to your group and be a leader. And what was interesting to me was I'm the youngest of four boys. I was much more used to following the crowd. I wasn't leading anything. I was the one who got dragged around all the time. 
So to go to a place where people expect it and they put you through training, you know, and exercises to make you lead groups and stuff, it was very eye-opening to me that, hey, I may have something to actually contribute as a leader. I'm not just going to follow my brothers around the rest of my life. Not that they weren't doing good things, but, you know, all that. So then I, uh, the next adventure sort of was there's no high schools in Saudi Arabia. The government would not let them build any high schools for foreigners. So all, we all had to go to boarding school. So Glenn led the way for us to go, for me at least, to go to India. And uh, in 1972, my family went to, on a, on a vacation, which we stopped first in Pakistan. This is in Lahore, Pakistan. And so we visited some, uh, they were very big at visiting places and historic places and where civilizations started. And then we crossed the border from Pakistan to India through no man's land. Now, 1971 was a big war. It was a war for Bangladesh. I mean, this was not a stable place. But we crossed the border carrying our suitcases, and there's no man's land with lots of soldiers behind all these bunkers and all this kind of stuff. My family was unafraid. They, they, they traveled all through Iraq and Iran in the 60s, too. I don't even have pictures of that. Then we went to Kashmir. We stayed on a houseboat as part of a vacation. And they took us to southern India in the mountains, where this is where I went to school. So uh, you'll see me up here in just a second. There I am, Mr. 16-year-old. Had the haircut. But nearby were game reserves where we could go watch elephants, see wild game, hike, live in the jungle, swim in holes, water holes. Uh, you don't want to get too friendly with elephants. Wild elephants can be uh, very dangerous. So this is a picture of my school. There's a postcard picture. So this right over here is my dorm. These were the school, school, some of the school buildings and the boathouse and this lake. Kind of like a resort. <laughs> yeah, it was very nice. And uh, a wonderful place to play, uh, play around and learn lots of things, which I'll share with you in a minute, a few more. But I had a very important lesson in India that, that changed my life dramatically. And uh, this is just a stock photo, but a, a man just like this, living on the street under a tarp. So I was waiting for a bus in a city and this man and his family were living under a tarp, kind of like you see here. And he was eating rice, what looked like plain rice that his wife had cooked for him. And he had two or three children running around under this tarp. And I was just, I kind of was staring at them because it kind of was sinking into me as a 16, 17 year old. This is these individuals' entire life. This man has gone off and done some day labor, come home with a few rupees bought some rice, his wife has cooked it, and he's eating it. And he will do that again tomorrow. And, I, and I'm sure I was sort of awkwardly, you know, staring at him, like, as I was processing this. And this man looked at me and motioned for me to sit down and share his rice. It's hard. It completely changed my life. It's not how much you have. It's what you do with what you have. This man's character just shattered my images of things about what it means to be big and tough and cool. And I, I never forgot it. And I thank India for that. And those of you who know I still go to India, you can see why it had such a big impact on my life. But in high school, I was not much of a real standout. Uh, I did some interesting things. We had a very small class, I'll show you. These are my award. I was in this play. So this is a Christian missionary-founded boarding school. And we ran, I was a bartender in a play about barroom brawl, which I got to, my brother was the derelict drunk. <laughs> so uh, we had some fun and uh, were maybe, maybe a little rebellious. We didn't pick the play, but it was interesting to be in. And then um, I studied guitar in, in, uh, in high school, and there was a teacher that taught me classical guitar, enough to where I performed at the end of the year. And he felt so bad that I'd worked so hard and had no awards that he made up an award for me. <laughs> Most promising beginner in music. <laughs> it's what you get when you're fourth child, right? You get a lot of these participation things. But anyway, nevertheless, that was my, that was, my roommate was class valedictorian, went to Princeton, won all the math and science high achievement, you know. I was the also ran in every category, including music. But I also learned to sail, which is another fun uh, piece of my life. It'll pop in and out. So this little boat was in that boathouse you saw earlier. And we fixed it up and uh, would go sailing on the lake. And it was, I learned it was very relaxing. And we learned to sail. And it had a lot to do with where I chose to live when I came here to work at NASA. Uh, some other adventures we did of my roommate and I in 1775, uh, when we were seniors, went to Nepal and climbed up above Mount uh, Everest Base Camp. 
So this is, I'm actually standing on Kalapatar, which is about 19,000 some feet. Base camp is down here on the Kumbu Glacier. The problem is if you go to base camp, you can't see Everest from base camp because you're too close to the mountain. So as a tourist, you go up, you climb up the Kumbu Glacier, then you climb up this little peak here and you get this nice view. Another life-changing experience. All the people on our team bailed out. They all got sick, couldn't make it. People that were from the U.S. that was in the group. Only my roommate and I, by ourselves, made it to this place. And uh, this was in 75, was, was before all the <coughs> tourists started going to uh, ever. It's lonely. And there's like dead people swinging off glaciers and at the bottom of crevasses. And I mean, we didn't see the bodies, but they could point out, yeah, the guy fell down there last week. There's little stone chortles where they make for the people who've died and stuff. It's one of those moments in life that makes you think about life and why you're alive. Uh, and I, 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 I treasure that. Uh, this is my uh, high school yearbook photo or sketch, as we did, and the statement. It's the only statement made with me in conjunction with physics. So that's why I put it, pointed it out. My father was a physicist, right? And now I work at NASA, so this is important. Uh, his love for physics is evidenced by the condition of his room, which tends toward chaos and disorder, uh, <laughs> so, which I was known for. So it's the only actual reference to me and physics in the same sentence. And as it says at the bottom there, I headed off to University of Michigan. But I transferred after one year to Ohio State, where I was swept away by a Buckeye. Young, get by. I met the first day I was there on campus, and it was close to love at first sight. And uh, she has uh, captivated my life for many years since. Uh, she should have had seen something coming, because while we were dating at college at Ohio State for the next three years, I took off and spent six months in India. So it's kind of a warning, I guess, because uh, I go every year to India now, those of you who know, for two or three months. And so I did intercropping research at the Ikrasat uh, Research Center outside Hyderabad, where they actually research growing, the way locals grow multiple crops in the same field, and they get an increased benefit from the field, increased yield. But there's no real explanation biologically or they don't know why. They don't understand that. Whereas our cultures are all monoculture. You know, we grow fields, which is easy and efficient for mechanization, but you get less yield per acre. So it was a very interesting research, which kind of made me think about sometimes people who we don't think know things actually know more than they, we think they know. Like they know what they're doing. You know, they don't need mechanization and efficiency. They need to understand what they're doing and taking a benefit, and their fields were healthier. Anyway, so that was an interesting side trip to India. I came back from that, and I was offered direct admission to the PhD program in agriculture at Ohio State. They said, your undergrad research thesis is better than most of our master's thesis. I mean, it was actual research, which you know, I published. <clears throat> but it was a change of direction. I said, no, I don't want to do that. PhD maybe, but I want to go do something else. And I had to graduate, which I did. My father took photos. This is one of the few times I was in the Horseshoe Stadium. We didn't go to a lot of games. But I did, so they actually deliver your, give you your diploma, all 10,000 of you. There I am in the crowd, my wave. And, uh, and uh, two weeks after graduation, uh, we got married in uh, Cincinnati. I mean, it had been three years we were dating, right? So uh, we got married down in Cincinnati in Mount Airy Gardens. And interestingly enough, I actually sang to my wife at our wedding. This will come back. Uh, in a later, later piece. So uh, the singing and music did pay off, I guess, to some degree, all those lessons. Which kind of brings me to my parents and the inspiration that they've been to me in many ways in my life. So this was my parents before they passed some years ago. Um, and there were really some interesting things about them. I shared some things about my mother. Uh, my father, I think, I concluded, loved three things in life. Physics and the curiosity of physics and astronomy, you take us outside, do things like that. He's always curious about things and how they work. Classical music, he played a lot of it, very loud, big classical music, made us listen to orchestra, you know, symphonies, which is fine, great influence, and his wife. He, he, he loved three things in life, and that sort of was enough. And it, it left an impression on me uh, because he took care of the things that were important. Um, and uh, it was a good role model for, for me as I started off in married life to think, I, I wouldn't mind ending up like that, which is not a bad, I, not a bad thing to think when you're young. But we went off to uh, uh, Bible school and studied how to go be missionaries and relief people because that's what we wanted to do. Here's this young couple off to save the world at 22, especially with those glasses. And uh, having a, a good command of Arabic language, 
We ended up in the Middle East, which wasn't entirely by accident, and we uh, worked for five years handing out relief supplies uh, in war-torn Lebanon during the kind of the worst of the war, 82 to 87. Marine bombing, barracks, all kinds of things, Israel, invasion, all, all kinds of interesting stuff going on. Um, some of our friends were kidnapped, some were killed, some were murdered. People we know wouldn't show up the next day. You find out they got a roadside bomb, took them out. I mean, it was that kind of life. Uh, I'll show some more pictures. We worked with a lot of youth in schools and churches, trying to help them restore their life to a somewhat normal life because their life was robbed of them by the nature of this war. We spent time going back and forth at the Israeli-Lebanon border where they tried to make a good fence, as they called it, a friendship border. It was interesting to see that went out. Uh, no, I did not drive the tank, but there was lots of this stuff lying around from modern wars, as well as 100-year-old wars, trenches from the World War I, still in the fields. Uh, just amazing. At the same time, this was the view from our house. <laughs> Beautiful country. Mount Hermon there in the background up at the left. Uh, um, Valley of Marjayoun on the, on the bottom right. I mean, it was just a beautiful country and beautiful people, and uh, it really makes you think about what could have been and what was but has not uh, been able to happen. Along the way, we had some children in Lebanon. Two of our children were born there. Uh, they uh, got uh, Middle Eastern names, <laughs> Yasmin and Jamana, which they're very thankful for sometimes. And uh, it was interesting raising little kids in a war zone. I remember uh, talking to Yasmin when she was two or three, must have been three, because we were having a conversation. And she asked me what all the bright orange lights were outside her window. Well, they were flares. They were shooting up shells, 155 millimeter shells that are, that are sick, phosphorus flares, because they're looking for terrorists in the, or in the orchards. So you're watching these shells, and they burn brightly. So I remember we used to call them the pretty lights, and then she'd go back to sleep. So you, you, you kind of learn some things. An interesting character came into my life, and this is one of the influential people that I'll mention throughout, Eli Haspani. He was a, a professional militiaman, killed people for a living. Um, he had his leg blown off by an improvised device while he was dismantling a booby trap bomb. And, uh, became a very uh, strong uh, Christian man, much stronger than me. Uh, this is me in New York. He came to the U.S., and he now pastors a church. Uh, he, he pastored a church in Beirut for a while. Then he had to flee because they were marked. And he uh, pastors a church for immigrants in Milwaukee. So I'm actually honored that I even met the guy. He's done way more than I ever did. But you never know what impact you have on somebody in your life. And we stopped on the way home from Lebanon in Erie and Jaya. These were classmates. From, uh, he was a classmate from Ohio State Agricultural School. They went to Arian Jai and worked among Aboriginal people to help them build sustainable agricultural methods. These are people like out in the, like really out, like where there's still cannibals roaming around. So it just made me feel like maybe we didn't do that much. You always think you did something until you meet somebody else and like, wow. It's good to be humble in life. And this brings me back to my brothers. There's all four of us, Fred, Andy, Glenn, and me, who really helped and stepped up. As much as they beat me up when I was younger, for example, we were not allowed to watch the Three Stooges, which probably saved my life. <laughs> or at least a couple of eyes and ears and maybe a finger or two. Yeah, I mean, they loved, my little older brothers were both into wrestling, and they wanted someone to practice on. So uh, that was what happened. But when I came back uh, from Lebanon, our family, we were shell-shocked, literally, and we had no idea how shell-shocked we were. And uh, they all took care of us, helped us, stayed with them, offered us money, whatever we needed, to help us get resettled. And it was a wonderful experience. Uh, my family had bought a vacation home in Pennsylvania, just up near Bedford, where we were able to go and relax. And it took a, took a couple years. It really took a couple years to unwind. Uh, my parents lived in San Antonio at the time, and so we made a trip over to visit NASA, another little bop into NASA. But I was, uh, went back to school at my brother's urging and uh, studied, got an MBA, and the MBA in South Carolina included a six-month stay in England as part of the program. So off we go with three little kids to live in England, for, uh, and we lived in this house on Flower Walk Lane, and this canal was out back. We were poor. That's an understatement. But the kids had a great time, and they never really understood what was the complaint about. But uh, we got through that. I went back to Cincinnati and worked on a farm, 
uh, where I found a place to live, and I met this man working at Procter & Gamble. So this was a professor from Cornell, who Joseph Novak, who a uh, great influence in my life, introduced me to making maps. Now those of you who know and seen the work I do understand that I use these things fondly called bubble maps or concept maps. And he introduced me to this visual way of thinking and uh, really changed a lot of my direction because it fit the way I think and work and I've used it as you know in all the things I do here at NASA to help model our decisions. I'll show you some later. Another man I met uh, named Bob McMath ran a business developing new products with Fortune 500 companies. Now he had collected a museum of 80,000 products over his entire life. So what we did was combine his collection of things with my method of developing new ideas and innovations and we worked together with companies to help them develop ideas. This is how I paid for my PhD. Um, and there's an example of one of the products, dog poo, shampoo for dogs, great idea. <laughs> so the other thing that this did was, he had been invited, he'd been on Letterman and a number of different shows at night and they always turned it into kind of a joke, like, you know, like dog poo, ha ha ha, like, whereas he wanted to talk about the business side. So he got these calls for some talk shows and he's like, I don't want to go to these things anymore. Ed, why don't you go? So launched was my TV career. So I have a few excerpts here. I was on a couple of talk shows that year, uh, and here they are. These are just short excerpts. We're back. My next guest collects what most people refuse to buy. He runs a museum dedicated entirely to supermarket flops. Please welcome the director of the new product showcase and learning center, Ed Rogers. Hey, Ed. How are you, buddy? Nice to have you here. They come to us and they say, we want to try something, but we don't want to try something that's tried before and failed. Right. Or we want to watch out for some mistakes people have made. So they come to you more or less to learn what I've been doing lessons learned for a long time. Marketing is wrong. Some kind of things have are worked, wrong. but maybe not in the right way. Okay. So lots of ideas like work just tried right, but maybe they'll get an idea and we'll fix it. And yeah. We'll do it right. All right. Well, show me some of the stuff you brought from the So uh, this, was, uh, this was an idea, microwave uh, ice cream sundae. Oh really? Oh really? Yeah. Sometimes they just they make so much sense in the laboratory and the guys are like, you know, all excited about it. Like, wow, this is gonna yeah. be great, you know? Yeah. And then they put it out there and they say, How come nobody's buying it? I would like to know the laboratory where that made sense, Ed, where somebody yeah. said, if yeah. we took ice cream and heated it, we'd have a big seller. What do we got here? Uh, this is another product that's fairly new in the market. This is uh, already moistened wet toilet paper. <laughs> What's wrong with you, Ed? <laughs> who would want that? Nobody wants that. Well, everybody wants it. Really? But who wants to tell their neighbors and friends that they use it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a problem. So it's like, you know, it's a big sign on my front door. Hi, welcome to our house for dinner. We have hemorrhoids. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that sign. So that's the problem, man. Right. Dog, um, dog poop. Dog poop, yeah, yeah, dog poop. <laughs> this is a great product. Really? Because I know a park where you can get this for free. <laughs> I think that's where he gets it. Oh, the, the idea of this was that it was shampoo. It's shampoo for a dog. But they called it dog poo. And that's, uh, it still sells, yeah. but I wouldn't expect to make it. Actually, if you're out money. shopping, you might want to put these two together. <laughs> yeah. All right. Useful. There we yeah, go. very useful. There's the close up. Ed, thanks for being with us. We really appreciate it. Look at uh, some of these guys. Come on back and join us. I'd love to do that. That's more. 60,000. 60,000? Ed Rogers, we'll take a break. We'll be right back after this. So he was in New York City, then I was invited to California to be on these ladies' show. Two housewives in California. We just collect products. Since most of them fail, therefore what we end up having is failed products. Let's, Let's see what you brought. Let's see what you Okay, I just love this. This is the greatest business to be in. Uh, this is a product that failed for, well, you just read the name. Yeah, cow, cow chip cookies. <laughs> yeah, I can see. Definite name problem. Yeah, there's kind of a name problem there, and you kind of keep thinking about it while you're eating it. Yeah, yeah, uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah. Negative connotations all right, over the place. Products yeah. have associations that go beyond just the shelf. And last but not least, here's my idol. Yeah. Their shampoo didn't go. Let's see the picture. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, why didn't her shampoo go? She was a hot babe there for a while. This is Stop, a, sir, yeah. don't shoot. Uh. That was huge. Farrah was huge. This is a good example of how you can even kill a good idea. And how? Well, it, it would be a slam dunk. I mean, Farrah's yeah. hair and all the rest. Yeah, of course. So they got the contract, apparently, and they worked on it. But the technical people, you know how they like to make things just right and just perfect? Yes. And year, two years later, they finally came out with a shampoo, and she was off the show, and the fat is gone. Oh, poor Farrah. Oh, you should yeah. probably gain weight and everything. Well, well thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back with more commercial fun. Don't go away. You can see how these prepared me for NASA.
Coming up, we got some products that make you kind of wonder, and we want to know what their makers were thinking when they dreamed them up. She was really nice. She is an amazing woman. the question, what were you thinking today? This is Ed Rogers' his company. Everybody's had those moments. Uh, but Ed Rogers' company stockpiles hundreds of new products. He brought along some of the more unique items in his collection to tell us what their inventors were thinking. Let's start with the garlic cake. Where's that? Garlic cake's right here. Hmm. A wonderful it's a product. Garlic cake. Yeah, it's garlic cake already baked. Not the baked. same as garlic bread. No, it's garlic cake already Wait. baked in the jar. Where you would mix garlic and sugar? Well, I'm not sure what you would do with it. <laughs> How old is this? From the house? I wouldn't so. open it. Oh, you would? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It sounds to me like something you might serve your ex when he comes over. That's good. Moving along? We have products that are what I call blunt products. I won't say that, but they can see what that is. Okay. These are products that we know what the problem is. Oh, God. That Everybody says, knows what the problem is. Can you see what, what that says? Is. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, I know what it means. It says... Uh, yeah, I won't say it on TV because then people will write me letters. Can you see what it says? Uh, chili makings. So I guess it's beans without gas. Is That's that what... it. Okay. But I mean, it's a little blunt is the problem. Yeah. And you don't a... want to like say, honey, pick me up a package of fartless on the way home. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's why this didn't go over too well. Can you get, I'll get a couple of bags of fartless. Will you? Actually, okay. people are still buying that. <laughs> Okay, what else well, you, you got? got? The problem. Here's okay. one for the ladies. What is this? This is called PMS Crunch. PMS Crunch. We all know about it. About we PMS all, I've ex Well, I, you know, not myself, but I've experienced the effects of um, it. So it's supposed to be like for when you're having PMS? Yeah, you eat that stuff. Once basically. a month, every month, you cry, you feel bloated, you feel a bit moody. <laughs> you need PMS Crunch. Okay. So you load that up in your cart, and that's when you meet Mr. Handsome in the checkout. Aisle. Right, who then sees this. Right. Again. Come on over tonight. Have a bite with okay. me. Okay. Uh, these are Old Fred's Fine Sex Olives. Ooh. Yeah. You want to try one? <laughs> Don't need to. <laughs> Thus ended my career on TV. It was short but sweet. They were all a lot of fun. And uh, she was just really fun to talk to. And she's every, to me, she's every bit what you see. Uh, and so anyway, I did go back and finish my PhD at Cornell. That was all why I was at Cornell. And uh, got a handshake when I got my PhD. And this is my father. I'm not sure who was more proud. He was uh, very, very proud to come and, come and see his youngest son. Everybody in my family has degrees. I mean, a PhD was kind of like the minimum. <laughs> like, you don't have a PhD, what's wrong with you? But anyway, it was an expectation. And it was, uh, I finally, finally pulled it off. Uh, the first job I got out of there was at UAH, University of Alabama, Huntsville where um, I taught business, and my kids played ice hockey, which was really weird. Uh, but they had a great team, and my son and my daughter both played ice hockey there. And I bought a sailboat. Finally got my own sailboat. Sailed on the river and learned to sail. I was only there three years because I got a job offer in 2003 to come to Washington and work for NASA. Here, so there's the whole fam moving into our new house uh, in, uh, in uh, Severna Park. And I met a man named Ed Hoffman, who also made a big impact on my life. So he was at headquarters, running Apple and training and learning, and all kinds of things were, try were going on at that time. It was right in the middle of the Columbia aftermath. I was hired right in between the accident and the report. So that was all very, very fresh. And this whole stuff about organizational culture was coming out. What do we do about that? Foam, we understand. Culture, what's that? And how do you fix it? And so I uh, remember I had that question, what are you going to do here from the center director? So it kind of became apparent to me that it wasn't my job to help us fix mistakes. We're pretty good at that. Because if we actually make a mistake, we can kind of figure out what it is that, we, that went wrong. But figure out how to learn what we did right. What are the things that we do? So I made a very simple program that says we learn. We don't, I'm not inventing anything that we don't already do. But let's do it better. Let's learn. So let's, this was a one chart presentation I had on what we do. You can see pause and learns, workshops, case studies, lessons learned, the things I do. And so I just took the learning, the natural learning cycle and said, let's do things that make it work a little better. So we're not broken, but we may be just not paying enough attention to this aspect. 
which is a very different thing than coming in to say, you know, you did something, you're, you're missing something. We just need to be better at it. And so do little things, case studies, lessons, pause and learn workshops. And uh, that leads me to another person who helped me look up in life, who, uh, Chris Scalise, who uh, at the time, uh, back in 2005, I guess, uh, was a deputy center director, I believe, at the time. And uh, he sat me down and said, Ed, I want you to develop a program that'll help our people get smarter. So that was where Road to Mission Success came from, that conversation sitting in his office. And uh, we talked about it, and I went out and we piloted it, and it developed it into the program that maybe perhaps many of you have taken. So I owe it to his vision to say, go do this. And uh, he's, he's that kind of that leader. He's inspired me in many, many different times. Um, I've written 50, 60 case studies that are used here. So I, wrote, I realized we needed some because we don't have any or he didn't when I got here, so I wrote bunches of them, most of them about Goddard, but some about other, other places. And these are used all over the agency now, not to mention academia and outside. So we're getting a couple of birds with one stone. Road to Mission Success has been offered. We're in the middle of the 24th offering right now. We're getting ready to offer the 25th offering. And uh, over 1,000 civil servants have taken this class. So it's had a huge impact across the center in small ways, Right? We're, we're increasing our learning capability 5, 10, 15 percent. But you do that across the whole center, you get quite an impact. So here's just the most recent uh, class. So then getting more recent, 2013 I had a midlife crisis. Grew a ponytail, took a detail at headquarters, took up singing. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean everything. Just kind of went a whole hog. And this brings me to another person, Crystal Johnson. So I came back from my detailed headquarters and worked for, began work for Crystal Johnson, who really helped me mature my career uh, the years, the last five, six years. Uh, she helped me understand how to work effectively in government. Because I've been to headquarters and I'd seen how things work and don't work, and the challenges, and wanted to help make more of a difference when I came back. So, uh, and then she let me sing to her at the holiday party. And I even bought a Harley. <laughs> I mean, I went all out, and, and so here's me riding around uh, the countryside here around Maryland, and I went to India, went riding with some buddies in India, and bikes all around, that was really dangerous, and uh, went on some rides with, with groups, not gangs, and even got my wife to ride with about 50 bikers all around the Eastern Shore, that was a big accomplishment, I'll come back to some other accomplishments with her. But uh, this leads me to another person in an event that influenced my life, and that's Art Stevenson. So he's my mother's brother's son, and uh, he's there in the blue shirt with his brother, myself, and that's my son-in-law on the left. And we went down to Alabama and went riding around for, uh, for some time. And Art Stevenson's been an inspiration to me for many years. A uh, uh, man of very high integrity, who has very deep faith, strong beliefs, strong values, and played some significant roles in leadership, both in TRW before that. Uh, then he was a center director at Marshall for some years. And then he was a vice president at Northrop Grumman. And uh, it just always been an impression to me that you can, you can play those kind of very high level roles and maintain all of your integrity and values. You don't need to compromise. And, I, and I've seen some of the things he's been through. So he uh, continues to be an inspiration to me. Um, I, in 2009, had an opportunity to go back and start teaching in India. This is the Indian School of Business, India's premier business school. So I was honored to teach there, and I've been teaching there for 10 years, uh, of course. Some of you know that, so you can see the connection now with my earlier upbringing and the impact India had on my life. It also has impacted RTMS a lot, because I get a lot of ideas teaching executives and MBA students that find out what works and can incorporate them, and RTMS has improved into even offering RTMS 2 for 15s and SESers here at Goddard for the last three years. All came out of the exec ed teaching I was doing in India for those years. So there's a nice back and forth play. But then I'll come back to my the wife's story and the singing. So when I was at Ohio State, my friend and I, the one I showed you a picture of in Irian Jaya, who was the agricultural missionary there. So we went to visit. He dated Mary's roommate. They were roommates in this little apartment. So one night in college, we got a ladder, went over to their building, put the ladder up against their second story window, climbed up to the top of this ladder with my guitar, and sang to her to try to woo her. It worked, I guess. 
So 35 years later, on our 35th anniversary, I rented a big band, put on a performance, and sang this song to her. Let me call you sweetheart, I'm in love with you. I think I sang a little better 35 years later. Let me hear you whisper that you love me too. Keep the love light glowing in your eyes so true. Let me call you Thank you. So she, re she requited this by taking up ballroom dancing with me. One of my passions forever, but she doesn't consider herself a dancer. She actually turned out to be a great dancer. And for the men, she's dancing to the theme from The Godfather. How cool is that? So uh, this is what we do now that the kids are all gone. I always wanted to learn saxophone. That's not a typo. I think we can take a Never could learn saxophone as a kid. So it, three or four years ago, I decided to pick up sax. Why not? Have some fun. This was my first ever public performance. So anything can be a game if you kind of take it that way. It doesn't mean things are trivialized. I mean, some games are very serious. Some games are a matter of life and death, like things going on in Lebanon. It just is an attitude that helps it be not so personal, I think, is what I tried to think about it. A game is a game. Just learn the rules, figure out what they are. If you don't like the game, then change the game. But in order to change the game, you have to kind of figure out what the game is that's actually going on. Otherwise, you're just kind of messing things up. You know. So life has come around. Uh, we uh, bought a home in Virginia where we we're planning to retire close to our grandchildren. My wife's getting into that pretty much already. And we're working on the next generation. As you can see there, she's already well, well uh, dressed in, uh, in NASA gear. But I'm still kind of tied into what happened when I came to Goddard, which is the lessons learned from Columbia. So we've started a Columbia uh, Space Shuttle Columbia National Tour in cooperation. Um, I'm supporting it with Apple and people from Kennedy. And what we're doing is we've, we've got our heads together and, and plan to take Columbia artifacts, pieces of the shuttle, to every center and put together a remembrance program and a lessons learned program. So here's the agenda that we did at Kennedy a few weeks ago. And you can see Mike Sinelli, the head of the Apollo Challenger Columbia Lessons Learned Program, which is the, what I've referred to. Uh, and I'm doing the lessons learned in decision making. And then our keynote address was by Evelyn Husband Thompson, widow of Rick Husband. This, the agency's paying a lot of attention to this, and it's really exciting. And it still is an opportunity to share a decision model. This is the slide, the key slide I shared about decision making, and you can see this was, this was actually news to a lot of people who'd never seen the decision making process as simply laid out as it's laid out in this simple model. A large piece of phone comes off. Actual site is hidden from view. Management concludes nothing could be done anyway and gets an expert opinion that believes foam couldn't hurt the orbiter. Later, in sequence, the de debris assessment team asks for imagery because of the remaining uncertainty, but management doesn't see a need because they've already concluded it won't hurt and there's nothing could be done anyway. And the agency, the organization, fails to respond. If you understand what actually happened, it's not to fault anybody, but if you don't understand what actually happened in the sequence of events and the importance the sequence had, you're unlikely to really learn much from it, decision-wise. So I presented this a few weeks ago at Kennedy to the a packed auditorium. You can imagine there was a lot of people there, and VIP people, Evelyn Husband made the trip, and et cetera. 
uh, two former NASA launch directors were on the panel. And uh, many people were very happy to hear us actually getting to the bottom of the lessons, which they had some inkling of, but were kind of maybe glossed over a little bit. And they're hard to talk about, um, but we need to. And so I look forward to continuing that, that journey to make sure we don't forget those very important lessons, because these kind of decisions affect all the kinds of things we do. Hopefully we don't cause loss of human life, but we don't want to make those mistakes again. So uh, to kind of summarize, I took up baking bread, just for whatever. <laughs> Anything can be fun if you put your mind to it, right? Can That's my band in high school, and there's me sailing in Alabama. Anything uh, that you can do. Life is more interesting if you make it a game or see the game that's in it, because then it just becomes a puzzle to solve rather than some annoying person cutting you off on the freeway. <laughs> it's really just a game, and there's rules, protocols to it or trying to find a seat on a Southwest flight. Just chill out, take a center seat. You know, you might meet somebody. Make a game and have life be more interesting. Thank you for listening, and thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Does anybody have any questions or clarifications or fact checkers? <laughs> John. What was your favorite game? My favorite game? Favorite game. I, I guess I would say, you know, when it comes down to day-to-day -day stuff, I like watching people. Like, I, I love sitting in an airport. You just figure out what everybody's doing. And if you watch, you can figure out what's going on. And then sometimes you're wrong. Somebody's fretting on a phone, looking at things, and you think, oh, he's having a bad day. And then, you know, his friend walks up and they're super happy. It's just, you know, well, it's, that's fine. You don't have to win every game you play. But it's still fun to play. Um, I'll share one other thing. Uh, Chris asked me, like, five years ago, can you help with JPSS? I said, well, I'll find out. He said, we can build satellites. We can build billion dollar satellites with the most complicated instruments. We can't figure out how to work together. I said, it's just a game. There's rules, there's protocols, there's things people do. It's, it's predictable. It's not as tight as engineering, but it is predictable. People behave and follow patterns. Figure out what they are. So I spent three or four years over at JPSS working on it. I had a lot of sympathy. People thought it was impossible. It's not impossible. Just figure out what the game is, model it, and make small differences. You don't have to change everything. Small differences add up. That's part of the game. Thanks. Anybody else have a question? You don't have to have a question. It's not, yes? Uh, favorite cuisine. Favorite cuisine? Um, <coughs> That's hard because I eat a lot of cuisine. Uh, but we, I had my birthday just a few days ago. My wife makes my favorite, which are uh, lamb shish kebabs. So she makes that for my birthday. So I guess that's kind of my favorite. <laughs> Interesting, yeah, but we eat a lot of food. A lot of variety of food in our house. I'll, 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 one, one last thing from my point of view. I made it a point to take all four of my kids to India even if just for a week or two visit. And it's had a big impact on all their lives. They could have gone, some, some have gone on summer mission trips of their own, youth trips to El Salvador, you know, whatever they've done. But I made a point of taking them all to India. You have to see at some place how the rest of the world lives. And it's made an impact in all of their lives. I would highly recommend that. You don't take them any, but take them somewhere. Let them see the rest of the world. We owe it to the rest of the world to at least be sensitive and see what they're doing, see how they're living. Thank you very much. Okay, that's time.